the honor of serving on the team here at Jesus Image and we're just so glad that you are here with us today for those that are joining us online we're so glad that you're joining with us today as well before we go into worship today I want to read this scripture from Psalms 33 verse 18 and as we prepare our hearts for worship let's read this it says but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him on those who hope in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine we wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, 
even as we put our hope in you. Come on, can we just take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship? Jesus, we place our hope, we place our trust in you today. Oh God, we ask that you would have your way. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this room. Lord, we ask that you would be magnified as we wait on you, Lord. We lift up the name of Jesus in this place. You are glorious, you are worthy, you are holy. We exalt your name today. In the name of Jesus we pray and everybody says, amen, amen. Come on, let's worship together.
pour it out, we pour it out to you, Jesus. You pour it out, we pour it out to you because you're worthy. We pour it out, we pour it out to you. We pour it out, we pour it out to you. We pour it out, we pour it out to you. We pour it out.
to be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens. As your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. Come on and lift your voice and sing it. Be exalted now in the heavens.
the joy of talking to you guys today about giving to the Lord. And it's such a beautiful time to talk about tithe and offering because we just got to sit and worship and be in his presence. I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 14, starting in verse 22. It says, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year and you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And I love this first because it says that when we give to the Lord, when we honor his word, when we tithe, that we learn to fear the Lord always that we get to walk in the fear of the Lord always. And I also love it because it says, you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. In other words, we get fed in his presence in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. And we all know that he is here today. So in the same place where we are fed, we get to give back to the Lord. And it is such an honor because he has given us everything our very life itself, the breath in our lungs, he has given everything to us. And we get this time to give back to him in our worship, in our song, and in our finances, and in our time. So I'm gonna go ahead and pray a blessing over the offering. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that you are provider. Lord, I pray that you would teach us to fear you always, to always walk in the fear of the Lord. And Jesus, that we would walk like you, that we would walk in your generosity and in your kindness, that we would be joyful givers, Lord. I pray that you would bless the tithe and bless the offering and you would bless these hands, bless the givers, Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So you guys can go ahead and text GIVE to the number on the screen. And if you guys are watching online, there is also a number on your guys' screen. And if you are in the room and need an envelope, you can raise your hand um, and an usher will bring you an envelope. And you guys can rush the buckets.
We love you. You guys can sit down. It's nice to have Michael back up here, isn't it? So we have a really, really special service today. So I want you to prepare your hearts for what God is going to do. I feel like this is going to be just a day that's going to change everything for us as a church. We have a father, um, Pastor Tommy Reed, who is going to be joining us via Zoom, and he has a word of the Lord for this house. But before we introduce him, I wanted to fill you in on Michael. Um, so we went to the doctor this week, and due to injury and overuse and not using his voice properly, he has what is like a broken blood vessel. So it is an easy fix. Uh, surgery is required. Um, we are believing that God is going to heal it, though. Amen? But if not, it will be a quick surgery. It is an outpatient procedure. And we have found an amazing doctor. And I'm not sure if he is saved or what, but on the Zoom consultation, he looked at Michael and said, you are going to fulfill the call of God in your life. <laughs> Out of nowhere, we're like, we like you. And um, he said, I am making it a priority to get you in quickly so you can be back to preaching in no time. Amen. Amen. Oh, he's writing to me, guys. Yes, he says, surgeries are always easier when they are on someone else. That's true. But you know, we trust the Lord and... Many people uh, do get this when you overuse your voice and don't treat it properly. This is very, very common. That's why Michael now has a vocal coach. It's awesome. I think I told you at school, like, he'll go, Brrr. he's always, like, warming up his voice now. It's, it's really amazing. But he will be back preaching, and um, one of the doctors even said, when this is done, your voice will actually be stronger than ever before. So... <laughs> Just keeping you guys in the process. He goes this week um, for his pre-op. Again, we're believing that the Lord will heal this completely on its own. So if you guys can pray with us, but this will be a very quick thing. And um, once the surgery is done, if the Lord doesn't heal him, then he will just rest for a little bit and he will be back here preaching and we cannot wait. So just wanted to fill you guys in, but... God is doing something very beautiful right now through Jesus Image Church, and um, so many fathers and mothers um, have joined around us this season, so God is going to do something really great. I'm sorry, the youth. Oh yeah, in the youth, if we have some time after for testimonies, we might share some testimonies, but the, the power of God has been falling at the youth, at Jesus' image, and God, yes, it's beautiful, and God is doing amazing things. So um, someone, a dear friend, wrote us not too long ago, and she said, I have a prophetic word for you, Michael, and we really trust her. She's a trusted voice in our life, and many people have said the same. They said, when you come back preaching, Michael, your spiritual voice will be louder than ever. So I just cannot wait for what God is going to do. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for just being in there, in the pocket with us, praying. It really means so much to us, and we can feel your prayers. And this is our favorite place in the world to be. So I just wanted to thank you and have a couple more little announcements. I also wanted to apologize. Um, last week when I was preaching the gospel, there was a lot of movement when I was doing that, and it is very distracting. And um, that will, reverence is always gonna be very, very important to us at Jesus Image, but the way I said not to not to move, I felt was too harsh. So will you please forgive me? I'm very sorry for that. I, I humbly ask for your forgiveness. We will always honor reverence here, and I'm sure I might say, please don't move, but I, I didn't like the way that I um, said it in the moment, so please forgive me. I love you guys so much, and I'm learning and I'm growing, and um, I, I won't talk like that again, but I love you. And then we have, thank you, Michael. Thank you, <laughs> Pastor Michael. Okay. Um, but we have an amazing guest, like I said. Uh, just for a moment, I wrote some of the stuff down because he is just, I want you guys to know who is pouring into us today. He's from Buffalo, New York. He um, dedicated me as a baby, but that's just, we, he's just so special to us. In 1982, I'm gonna be 40 in next month, I can't believe it, but 40 is a new 30. Um, but 
He really was the one when my dad um, got his start in the States. It was Pastor Tommy Reed who took a chance on a young, wild guy. And um, he also helped Marilyn Hickey. He gave her her start as well in the States. And he's really a father to people like Pastor Bill Johnson and us and so many. He gave Michael, yeah, the very first pastor that ever had Michael at an event. Um, and it was with Bill Johnson and Jack Hayford. And we were like, oh my gosh, how are we even in this room? It was Pastor Tommy. He saw something in Michael before many did. And he really is a father. And he has a word of the Lord. And on top of that, he... He is the founder of the Tabernacle in Buffalo, New York. Our sweet Amy Pazinski, who is out of town, she actually came from there, and um, that has been her spiritual father for years. And that really was a great, a great revival hub in America. And he also worked with uh, Pastor Cho, correct, and 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 was just just a, a forerunner in what God did um, years ago. And he reached out to us not too long ago when he saw our building, just to know people like that are even watching what God is doing here. He saw the building that we're building and God gave him a word of the Lord for this house. So he has something he's gonna share with us today. So if you could just posture your hearts and get ready for what God is gonna do. And if we could welcome Pastor Tommy Reed. Welcome you. Thank you, Pastor Tommy, so much for taking the time to be with us. We love you so much. It's so good just to thank see you. your face. And Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. We love you. You can we are you, so to be with you. Yeah. You you can start whenever you're ready. <laughs> well, we're here just to introduce Dad to you, tell our stories. We have such similar paths. Our lives have crisscrossed with the yeah. Hinn family yeah. and now the Kulianoses for so, so many years. And so I think what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to tell a little bit of Dad's story, like right from the beginning, if that's good. And we're going to go through some of the key things that happened in Dad's life and how this led to the point that we're in in history. What you're looking at here today is my dad. Daddy, and I'm the only one that can call him that, and I'm going to make sure everybody knows that for just a moment, but you're also looking at spiritual sons and daughters on the stage of Jesus Image, and our da my daughter is in the, off in the audience today because she is yeah. at Jesus School, so we are entrusting our precious Kayla to you guys because this place called Jesus Image I'm going to cry. I just got off the stage leading worship this morning, and I left them in a frenzy over there, but I'm telling you... What you have at Jesus' image, is, it's holy. And I have nothing else to say, but it's holy. And I've been everywhere across the world with Dad, and we've done so much. And I've never encountered anything that's such a pure river of God mm -hmm. that is without agenda, that's without politics, that will not tolerate the foolishness of what we have made out of ministry. And what you have is a treasure, and that's why the nations of the world are gathering and they're following you. And so we have similar stories. So let's dive into the story, and that's, Jeff. You know, and that's why your daughter, my granddaughter, is there, mm -hmm. because we want her where God is. Mm -hmm. And there's something happening in that in your ministry in a, in, a, in a way that maybe not any place else in the world. Yeah. And we've entrusted Kayla with you because we know God wants to use her. Yeah. And every growth we see, we honor you guys for, and we yeah. thank you for that. So, Dad, yeah. born here in Western New York, we're going to try not to cry through this, <laughs> born here in Western New York to a family that didn't know Jesus, although we know that through your mom's background, there was a lot. My of mother <clears throat> was raised in a Pentecostal home, mm -hmm. but rejected Christ and married a non-Christian man, mm -hmm. my father, who had never been to church. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't long before God began to deal with her. And of course, she dragged my dad to church and they both got saved. <laughs> and down into the first few years of your life, 
you had a lot of obstacles that you had to overcome. And first, you, know, you were a stutterer, right? I was an unbelievable stutterer. I could hardly get two words out, mm -hmm. one following the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I would tell, I never will forget, I was in the living room of our house in Springfield, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And all of the executives of the Assemblies of God were in the room. And my mother was proudly telling them that my son's going to be a preacher. And I remember one of them looking at her and said, that's impossible. He can't talk. <laughs> and I heard that and I thought, is that what they think of me? Mm -hmm. Because I knew that God had called me. Mm -hmm. And I knew that in spite of all of the physical disabilities that I had, God could still use me. And before that, you had contracted polio. I contracted polio when I was a child and uh, was a cripple, could not walk. And uh, God walked into the room and I, I'll never forget, I, I was laying on the couch in the living room of our house and Jesus walked in the room and I said, I. How am I going to preach? I can't even walk. And uh, I heard the voice saying, the pastor's not here. There's no one here to pray for you. But I am Jesus and I'm here. And I reached out that moment. And in that phenomenal moment, I pushed myself up to the side of the bed. And I pointed my finger at the devil. And I said, devil, you are not going to keep me in bed any longer. And at that moment, I took and took my first step and my second and third. I ran upstairs, put my clothes back on. I ran back down. I looked at my mother as I ran. And the last time she saw me, I was crippled in bed. Now she saw me walking. And she said, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, well, I'm walking. <laughs> Didn't she drop a pan of milk she was carrying? She, yeah, yeah, we had a whole, whole <laughs> pan of milk there. And it dropped off of her. And... Uh, uh, it's a phenomenal time when your life begins with a miracle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And don't you think that vision of Jesus is what has pushed you through some of the hardest seasons and the most difficult transitions? It was a vision of Jesus. You saw him at the altar in the... I, when I was eight church. years of age, a little tiny altar of a of Assembly of God Church in Eastern Aurora, New York, not very far from here church of about 30 people. I was at the altar one night and Jesus came to me and told me that I was going to preach. And I said, I, I can't do that. I stutter. I, I, I don't have any ability to do that. And uh, God said, no, I called you. Mm -hmm. And I remember people making fun of my mother saying, you can't tell him that because he can't talk. And, uh, but I knew that there was something beyond who I was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Little did I know that God would take me and I would, by the time I was in my, in my 20s, I'm pastoring the largest church of the Assemblies of God in the world. I took Lester Summerall's place at Manila at Bethel Temple. The little boy who couldn't preach and couldn't talk. Here I am pastor of this large church and went from there to work with Cho. Mm -hmm. And uh, we pioneered the largest church in the world. I want to back up for just a second because you are probably the last last one left from what we would call the Tent Crusade era um, back in, that would be the 50s. In, in the Voice of Healing. In fact, somewhere around here, there's a notebook <laughs> with all of the Voice of Healing articles about uh -huh. your dad and, and yep. uh, my dad and traveling across America. So that would have been alongside Oral Roberts? Um, well, Oral Roberts was in the Voice of Healing originally. Mm -hmm. Then he started his own magazine. A. a. Allen was mm -hmm. in the Voice of Healing originally. Uh, it was uh, started by a man in Shreveport, Louisiana, by the name of uh, of Jack Moore, who was mm -hmm. a wealthy businessman. Started a magazine, and our schedule was in there. We were part of the Voice of Healing. It's just an incredible thing that I think our generation has lost connection with that incredible level of faith. I remember you telling me last night as we were talking about things about Jack Coe and you saw Jack Coe and there was, wasn't there 63 people lined there up? There were 60. This is an interesting story. I never will forget it because I had never seen a visible miracle. I'd had one in my life, but I'd never seen a visible miracle. 
and he lined up 63 women. In those days, they had no none of the, the medications we have for goiters today. Mm-hmm. And these women, 63 of them had goiters hanging out. It was an awful sight. Wow. And I watched him touch the first goiter and said, in the name of Jesus, and he hit her across the woman, and I thought he was going to knock her off. <laughs> and I looked, and the goiter was gone. And then the second and the third, I watched 63 goiters disappear in a moment of time under Jack Coe's ministry. Tell them about the one with uh, the man that was hunched over as well. well we don't advise to do it this the, way. But... Uh, uh, at the Metropolitan Opera House in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh-huh. who came on the platform, was looking straight at the ground. He, he couldn't get up. He was looking, so he had to walk with his face toward the ground. And uh, I never will forget Jack Coe taking him. He pulled his shoulders back and said, in the name of Jesus, and you heard the bones crack. He said, man, the guy's going to kill a man. <laughs> and took him, straightened his bones up, and then he took his big foot. And Jack Coe was a big man, took his big foot and pushed it in his back and said, in the name of Jesus, run. And he took off the Metropolitan Opera House and began to run. It was a day of phenomenal miracles. I would say that knowing your whole story and obviously being your daughter, we those kinds of things have set up the trajectory of your life and obviously mine and our, our my children and, and those that have walked alongside us in covenant. It's based on, first of all, the encounter with Jesus, the vision of Jesus. Yeah. And then anything is possible. Anything is possible from that point on. I, I think the trajectory of my life was set by your grandmother that you never met, died long before you were born. Who was called by God in the ministry when she was a teenager and then turned her back on God, married a non-Christian man, and then they came together to meet Christ. And she always felt she failed the Lord. But she had this amazing desire just to tell the story of Jesus. She was so much like you are. You, her tears were the same. Her passion for God was the same. And I watched her spend the last five months of her life dying of cancer and thinking that she had failed God because she didn't respond to God when she was younger. But yet I saw her obedience to God set up something in my life and I think in your life that has changed the trajectory of our lives. So fast forward, um, you get the call, you go to the Philippines. Yeah. This is another thing we have lost connection with. You went with just enough fare. You sold everything you had. We just sold everything. Fare. We sold our car. I remember I had a 1954 Cadillac. Mm-hmm. I sold it that paid our one-way fare out of freighter to the Philippines. We arrived in the Philippines with a one-way fare, no place to live, completely homeless because we had no money to get a motel. We're 10,000 miles away from home. And I remember walking to my dad and in spite of, and on top of all that, he gets sick. And he's dying of some, I guess, dying of some kind of a, uh, of a tropical disease. And I walked in the room and I said, Dad, what are we going to do? We're 10,000 miles away from home. We, You're sick. I don't have a way to even get home. What are we going to do? And he looked at me and he said, that telephone is going to ring over there. And when it rings, you and I are going to be the new pastors of Bethel Temple. Bethel mm-hmm. Temple was the largest church in the Assembly of God, 7,000 members. I think everybody's seen a picture of the it's in those Voice of Healing magazines, the picture of that great church. And uh, he said, we're going to be pastors to that church. I said, Dad, you're a businessman. You've never pastored before. I'm a, I'm a young 20-year-old. I, I've ne- they've never asked me. That. There's no way a denomination is going to ask us to pastor that church. <laughs> Within 30 minutes, the telephone rang, and the... A committee in Springfield, Missouri said, we want the two of you to pastor Bethel Temple. Mm. And we became pastors of that church. And Lester Summerall, as your spiritual father, that kind of... Well, that's how we met him, because they couldn't seem to find, I guess, a person 
who could follow up through the miracles that it started with. Yeah. And uh, Lester Summerall saw us as embracing his ministry, and he became our best friend. Without Lester Summerall, I would not be where I am today. And from there, Korea. Korea. How did that happen? <laughs> this is quite a story. Well, because Bethel Temple had grown so much when we were there, uh, the Assemblies of God said, we'd like you to meet a young man in Korea by the name of Cho. He had 300 people. Uh, nobody knew who he was, but they knew there was something in his spirit. They did not know it would be the largest church in the world. Uh, I remember sitting with him at the train depot in Daejeon, Korea. Brother Cho was at the table, and my dad was at the table. And, and uh, I remember my dad all of a sudden looking down at the table, and here we are at a train depot, and said, I believe we're going to build the largest church in the world. I said, well, Manila is one of the largest. I don't know. What do you mean the largest? How big is it? It will be the largest church in the world. Hmm. And I saw through the prophetic that church began to take root. And we watched it grow from 300 people to hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. I remember you talking about the struggle when Dr. Cho asked you to stay in Korea and pastor yeah. with him. Yet there was something in your spirit for this little city called Buffalo, New York, that you couldn't let go of. What was that like? Well, we were on a train, and we, uh, in those days they had some old cars from the American trains they brought over during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're sitting in one of those little, little rooms that had three beds in it. And... Uh, I heard the voice of God through my dad saying, this is going to be the largest church in the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't imagine that. Here was Dr. Cho sitting in that an unknown Korean pastor. And yet in that room was this birthing of the largest church that ever existed in the world. I don't, I don't know how many members it was. They said a million but somewhere between 800,000 and a million members in one church. But I remember it was just, I remember it was just a dream that somebody talked about. What was inside of you that you could leave that? I mean, that to go from just a few hundred to a few thousand in the 60s yeah. is something that is a dream for people coming up in ministry yeah. that are living in their flesh, that are living in human desire for yeah. success. And then God says to me, I want you to leave it. Mm -hmm. I want you to go back to Buffalo and open a church. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found a little church in Buffalo with 60 people, left the, the, this phenomenal church of hundreds of thousands to take a church of about 60 people. And for seven years, we couldn't get over 100 people. And it made no sense at all. Why did we leave that? And why did we come to Buffalo, where you and I are sitting today? I, I don't know, except that I know it was God. And so that struggle where it seemed like all the success was there when you were young, and then you come here, and success as measured in the world's eyes is not yours in this yeah. moment. And I remember the struggle, you talking about the struggle, because that would have been right before I was born. And yeah. I remember you talking about the struggle that you kept asking, in essence, God to be part of what you're doing. God, yeah. why aren't you here in the midst of it? And then didn't he speak to you? Was it on the, the well, bridge? Well, yeah, I, <clears throat> there were several things he said to me. The first thing mm -hmm. was that I was driving my car, and all of a sudden I was taken uh, in some kind of a vision out of the seat of the car. I looked down and saw my car down. I don't even know how all this happens. It doesn't even make sense. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, God is saying to me, I'm going to give you a new heart. And uh, I, I look down and I see this 1956 Cadillac that I should be down there driving. I guess I was driving, but I, I, I'm now at a different perspective. And God said to me, I'm going to take and do a heart transplant. 
I'm going to give you my broken heart for the world. I, you know, Amy, I always thought that God hated the world. They were sinful. They were, they were against God, and they were rebelling against God. And I thought God hated all that. God hated sin. And I thought God hated the world. And all of a sudden, I saw God from a different perspective. That in the heart of God, in the very heart of God, he sees a broken world. And this brokenness is in the heart of Jesus for our world. <laughs> and I saw something from a whole different perspective. And I went to Korea with that in my spirit. Mm -hmm. That God had a broken heart for the world. Mm -hmm. I remember there was another phrase that honestly has kept me and defined my life. And I think it went something like this. Tommy, when, when are you going to stop asking me to become part of what you're doing? Yeah. And when are you going to simply become part of what I'm doing on the planet? And I think that is what has driven me when all the nonsense of ministry and all the nonsense of people and their growth and what they define as success and their criticism. It's driven me to know and be able to say that's not Jesus. Yeah. Because becoming part of what he, he's doing is to transcend all of that and to rise to a dimension where we see in another realm, we speak in another realm, we experience Jesus in another realm, and then we bring that heaven to earth. And that is what, to me, has set you apart. That's why you're here at 89. You asked me last night why you're still here when all the peers are gone and even a lot of your spiritual sons are gone. Everybody, everybody's gone. Uh uh, Lester Summerall is gone. Oral Roberts is gone. Robert Schuler is gone. All of my, th these were close personal friends. As you know, they were your friends. And all of a sudden, all of my friends have gone to heaven, except for Al Warner. He's still here. <laughs> but, uh, and a few other people. And Pastor Benny is here. Pastor Benny. He's still around. He was, he was, he was kind of my son. Yeah. You remember that? He was kind of like your mm -hmm. big brother. But Dad, you're here because we need you. Yeah. And you've said, I'm going to live to see the next move of God. Uh, yeah. And I know we're going to transition to what you have to say to Jesus' image, but I would love if you would just tell the story, because the church was at, finished that story, because it sets this up, of what happened when the church is just running 100, 120 people. And all of a sudden, God's moving in a different place. And you're wondering, yeah. I'm the Assemblies of God Church. <laughs> and you're not moving here. What's going on? Where, where was God moving at that moment? And how well, actually, it? what I didn't know, I was going to find out, was God was moving in the gymnasium of the Basilica, mm -hmm. Our Lady of Victory Church in uh, Lackawanna, New York. Mm -hmm. I I heard they had a prayer meeting, but I thought that was Catholic people there. <laughs> uh, you know, I wasn't sure God was doing it. Why would God go there? I mean, I had a Pentecostal church. <laughs> he, he ought to be coming here. Why would he go there? That made no sense at all to me. We got uh, the corner on that market. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just, uh, to me, there was theology I didn't agree with. Then. Why would he come there? And yet, I remember walking in to that gymnasium that night with 500 people and watching that little Catholic priest, Jerry Walters, who would come to live with us. Mm -hmm. We took him into our home because he had no place to go when he left the Catholic Church. And, and I watched him stand up in front of 500 people and give an altar call and there had to be 150 people come forward for salvation. And I said, God, I don't understand you. I, I, I thought that I came to build you a church. Why have you come to the Catholic Church? I don't have an answer to that question yet. Except that I went there to find God. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand that. Uh, 
and yet maybe I do. Maybe God comes to places that are foreign to us and different to us. Um, I think he does. And at that moment, there was so much turmoil there. They all moved to the tabernacle and came to yours. So you had that you know, instantaneous grew, growth. Instantaneous growth. Amazing growth. Mm -hmm. We were running about 120 people. And then that night, all of a sudden it exploded. Mm -hmm. And we had two Sunday night services. We had actually had 397 chairs set up in the building. <laughs> It was filled twice. It was filled to capacity. Of, mm -hmm. At 7 o'clock, it was filled to capacity at 9 o'clock. And we increased from about 120 people to almost 800 in one single night. And then came along these crazy Jesus people. Yeah. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, um, your sweet Catholics are now faced with hippies with hair down to yeah. very low places and overalls and no sneakers and no yeah. shoes and coming in and um, messing up church business as usual. But there was a hunger for God. There was I remember him telling me the story of, wasn't it the superintendent, like an AG superintendent's wife? Well, I actually, let me tell you who she was. <laughs> the wife of the, the, the district superintendent of New York State, who had been the pastor's wife at the tabernacle before I came. Jeepers. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were the J. Roswell Flower family, which was the founding pastors of the Assemblies of God way back in mm -hmm. Hot Springs, Arkansas. And I remember taking her back. She said, will you take me back to the back room? I said, Sister Flower, are you sure you want to go back there? There's about 400 kids back there. She said, yeah, I want to go back. I took her away from the preachers, 500 preachers in the sanctuary, took her back to the gymnasium. And there were uh, somewhere between the 400 kids sitting on the floor, worshiping God. Remember Sister Flower looking at me and saying, Tommy, there's more of God here than there is in there. We had experienced God. How God comes, I, I, I don't really understand that because he doesn't follow a formula. Mm -hmm. He comes where there's hungry hearts. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it's very different. And, uh, you know, I, I keep saying to people, they say, what, what do you see? I say, I see Jesus saying to me, I'm coming to my church. And it's not going to be normal. It's not going to be like it was. When Jesus comes to his church, it, it, it kind of throws away all of the restrictions of religion. And God is there. And I think that's what happened. And you were, you were how old? You were a little tiny girl. Mm -hmm. But your life wouldn't be the same if that hadn't happened. It's been the presence of God. Yeah. You've never been content for church, and you've honored and you've respected and you've treasured people that yeah. probably didn't deserve it. But you took us always yeah. into his presence, and it's defined who we are to go from the 50 people that you came here yeah. to 21 churches around the region and networks of churches and helping to launch ministries. The story of Pastor Benny, <laughs> yeah. I remember you were telling me uh, so many times, it was in the early 70s, and this unknown preacher from Canada <laughs> yeah. brought him to the States and had him here probably what... Well, how, how it happened there. was the full gospel businessman had lost their speaker. Mm -hmm. And... Marty Phillips, who was Catherine Kuhlman's manager, mm -hmm. called me and said, I found a young man. He has the anointing Miss Kuhlman has. And he charter a bus. And we'll show the Catherine Kuhlman film. It. And she mentioned uh, Queensway Cathedral. I'll rent the cathedral if you would just bring a busload up from Buffalo. And I said, how would I get a busload of people to come see a film? 
She said, I don't know, Tommy, but you've got to hear this young man. Well, I didn't hear it then. But later, the full gospel businessmen lost their speaker, and they said to me, do you know a speaker? I said, I don't. But Marty Phil Phillips told me about a young man by the name of May Hinn. And he has an anointing like Miss Kuhlman's. And you got to have him. That's when he first came. You were just a little girl. Um, it, it, you know what amazes me? Is that God doesn't follow a pattern. We think that, you know, he comes to a cathedral or he comes to a big place or he comes where there's a lot of people. Sometimes he comes to a, to a living room. Or, or, or he comes to a, an old building, a barn, where somebody kneels down a, and finds God. God is unusual because God owns the universe. And he comes to us in ways we don't understand. And, and Amy, if I could say anything to people today, it would be that God is coming again to his church. And with all we go through, because, you know, some preachers today are going through really difficult times physically. And uh, they wonder how this is all going to come out. I think it's all a picture that God is coming to his broken church. And he's going to come with his power and his glory in a way that we don't understand. We can't understand it. That's what happened then. I, I, I don't understand it because, uh, you know, we went from 100 people to hundreds overnight. Mm -hmm. And I wonder where you would be if that hadn't happened. People have often asked you over the years to speak at church growth events. Uh -huh. You know, we had chose um, yeah. church growth international organization would speak at those and and you're always your your famous answer is I don't know how churches grow. I don't know I don't know how it grows. I know I don't. I've got nothing. And the only thing that you've always said goes back to hosting his presence. Yeah, hosting his presence, yeah. And tending to that, being faithful to that, and keeping that river as pure as possible. And well, that's what that. Miss Kuhlman did, and uh, that's what. Pastor Benny learned from her. Mm -hmm. It was a hosting of his presence. And I don't know how that works. I don't think you just come and sit in the corner until he comes. Uh, I'm not sure there's a formula for doing that. But somewhere in the midst of all of the, the garbage that's happening in our world, God meets sometimes a small group of people. And he comes to them. And everything changes. God has given you a word a couple, I think it was a couple of days ago before you knew that we would be sharing with you guys. You were writing and said that you believed God was giving you this for a significant audience and weren't sure what that was. And then this opportunity, thanks to our covenant relationship with Jesus' image. Um, so why don't you just release this word that's in your heart? <clears throat> I am uh, honored that uh, Michael and Jessica Kulianos are here in this room today. Uh, it's beyond my ability to understand up here how the two people who are probably affecting our globe more than anyone else would be in this little gathering today, sitting right over here. I, I just, uh, it goes beyond me. But here's what I wrote down. God is recreating the atmosphere of the world. A divine moment is coming to our world, a supernatural moment. I'm not sure what that means, but I, I was on the back lawn of your house probably a year and a half ago. And I remember God speaking to me. I, I wondered, you know, I'm 
I'm getting toward 90 years of age. Am I going to be here? Am I going to preach anymore? Uh, is life over for me? Is ministry over for me? And I'm sitting, I'm walking back there and, I, and, and God said to me, you're asking the wrong questions. The question is not whether you're going to minister or not. The question is whether I'm going to minister or not. It's not going to who's standing in the pulpit. It's going to be whose heart is going to touch the world. And I, I saw this, God creating a supernatural moment. It's like creating a new atmosphere. I'm not certain what it means, but I wrote down... It's an atmosphere where everything is possible and nothing is impossible. Mm -hmm. And nothing is impossible. God puts faith in us, but it's also around us. Faith is not only something we have in our heart. It's an atmosphere. It's something we feel. It's something we walk into, and God is there. I'll never forget the first time that I stood in Earl Roberts' presence. Uh, I always wanted to meet him. Never knew he was going to become a personal friend. Never knew I was going to be the, the treasure of his board. I, I didn't know all those things, but I was in the Ten Crusades. I sat one of the folding chairs. I saw God move, and I, I said, oh, if I could just meet that man one day. And I, one day I stood in his office, and I'll never forget the, <clears throat> what he did for me. You have to picture his office. It, it, it has this huge glass. It's probably, probably 15 feet high, maybe 20 foot high. It's probably 40, 50 feet wide. And it looks out after the, over the ORU campus. And Oral said to me, Tommy, I want you to, he put his arm around me and he said, Tommy, look at, you see out that glass window? That's what God, that's how are you. God gave, God put it in my spirit. God gave me the ability to raise the money to build it. God put that here in my spirit. That's, that's, that's what my spirit created out there. But he said, wait a minute. He said, turn and look at the painting I have on the wall. And I saw this huge painting painting of Jesus and the catch of fish. They had thousands or hundreds of fish until the boat was sinking. And there were three disciples. Two of them had their eyes on the fish, on the catch. One of them had their eyes on Jesus. And Oral put his arm around me and he said, Tommy, I've got to remember never to look at the fish I caught. But let me only look at the Jesus who created the harvest. It's a phenomenal moment, I think, when we realize that God creates special moments in our universe when anything is possible. When it's possible to build a university, when it's possible to build a church of thousands, when it's possible to touch a nation, when it's possible to buy a tent for oral that seats was at 12,000 people and it goes from city to city and people jam it until you can't even, and you wonder how does this happen? I remember sitting with Benny on the platform one day and seeing the crowd of 15,000 people and saying, Pastor Benny, how does it feel to see all these thousands of people that God has drawn to this place that really you haven't had much to do with. God brought them here. There is something that God is creating in the atmosphere of our world today that has to do with faith. Mm. We're going to step into a new dimension of faith. God said to me, I created the world in an atmosphere of faith. I spoke the universe into existence. 
with my faith. There is a world out here that's that I think we have to realize we, we've worked out of doubt so long. We've worked out of uh, lack of the supernatural so long that we forget that God has been with his hands creating a new world of, of faith in which we're going to see things happen that go beyond our ability to understand. Does that make any sense to you? Yes. It's what the world's crying out for. Yeah. That place that's so holy, that place that whatever veil you think is between heaven and earth is non-existent. That place of the holy, I, I can't let it go. We, we've become so common and we've made God so common that we have missed holy. We've missed the holy. That moment when God visits its people, it's, it, it's holy. It's not commonplace. We're not worthy of it. It's holy. And the world can't put up. They, they have no tolerance for church as it was. And we're moving into the place where those that will go after the holy are going to see things like we've never seen before. I remember you saying last night, there's a world inside of me, Amy. I, I, there's a fire in my bones yeah. for this. I can hardly talk about the, the presence of God. Yeah. And, and you know, Amy, I, I don't know how to really describe that because, uh, you know, when you get to be my age, and you realize that the world has passed you by. Uh, uh, you don't have a church anymore. You sit in the front row. You're not preaching anymore. And and that's all right. I'm 90 years old. I mean, I don't need to preach. But yet there's a fire burning inside of you. And I, what does God do with that? I'm not sure what God does with that. But I do know the fire I feel burning inside of me is going to touch the world. I don't know how. I don't know that I'll be standing in the pulpit. I don't think I will be. But there's something that God is about to do in our world that he has never done before. It's going to include, include the miraculous. I mean, we're going to see perfect healing that we've mm -hmm. never seen before. I believe that, Dad, you're speaking it into existence. You're, in essence, the prophetic that is inside of you, that is that fire, is co-creating with God yeah. at this moment. That's why you're still here. Well, <laughs> you know, why, I don't know I why I'm here. You, you know, if why Michael they, has anything to do with that, I think he's got a place know, for you to preach. <laughs> you know, I, and I don't know why uh, God has given me friends like Michael mm -hmm. Pugliano's and Jessica. We don't see each other very often. Mm -hmm. But there's something in our spirits that, that matches what mm -hmm. God is doing in our world. Yeah. And, and I know that God has a specific role for them, the two of those great peoples, that he doesn't have for anybody else in the world. There, there's something they're going to do. And it's not going to be like anybody else. It's not going to be like Oral did, or it's not going to be like Billy Graham did, or it's... It, it, it's not going to be like the fellow that built the biggest church in the world is going to do. It's not going to be like Dr. Cho. God is going to come to his world. And uh, I have to sit here saying, how did I get to be sitting in this chair uh, with you beside me, my daughter, with God's anointing on her, with Michael and Jessica Culliano sitting here today, who are probably, in my estimation, two of the greatest servants that God has on this planet today. How did we all get in this room together? I don't know that. I don't. I. I don't know how that happens. Well, I don't know how God creates that. I believe, Dad, you've walked in covenant with Pastor Benny, and he's. You know, to me, kind of Uncle Benny, <laughs> not many people can say that, but we have walked this road for a long time, yeah. and Jess, I, um, the other day, when I saw you minister, I saw, I saw your daddy, and I saw 
our daddies. There's something inside of you that God is positioning now through you and, and Michael and your children that is going to take all of the combinations of legacy and all these amazing people and bring it to the next generation and raise a generation that know how to wear the mantle well because it's Jesus. It's not about this person's anointing or that person's anointing, but it's Jesus. Dad, you uh, had uh, sent this over to Michael a, a couple of weeks ago, I believe, um, when you saw the building yeah. about um, the, the video about the building. And I, if you want to read that or add what you feel. Uh, it's hard for me to put this in words because I have so much feeling about it. I, I, I love architecture. I've never built anything beautiful. I built some buildings, but you know, they're just housing people. I've never built something that's that's really an architectural masterpiece. Uh, here's what I wrote to, to Michael. I just watched your amazing video of the Jesus image uh, of, the, of your new Jesus image complex. You're building a dream I've had envisioned in my spirit for many years, building a complex where thousands of young people would come from all over the world to worship Jesus and be discipled in an atmosphere where thousands of youth would be gathered and receive an education to change the world. Their education would be centered on learning to know the heart of Jesus. I dreamed of someone being raised up by God who would build this where all of the architecture would be linked to great art and involve the beauty and wonder of God's heart for worship through historic art, the greatest of European art. I had a friend who built a large church that you've been to where uh, they had a special emphasis on recreating some of the art of Europe. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that building? Mm -hmm. I don't even know if it's there anymore, but it was a beautiful cathedral with all of that art. And I see that happening. Uh, everyone else was creating buildings out of glass and wood and bricks that looked like a plastic world. But this building you met with Jesus and seen his vision. Uh, I really believe that. I, I really believe that God wants to use the wonder of art, especially in architecture, to create an atmosphere that goes beyond anything we've known before. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? <laughs> oh, Dad, <laughs> you messed me up. Yes, and I think I think where we what you've shared so many times, just the two of us together, talking with mom and Jay. The special relationship of covenant that we have, that you have walked in, is now going to another generation. And they're building, it's so funny, it's almost a Hebrews 11 moment, where those things that have been in your spirit, that you've wanted to do, may not have been intended for you personally to build, but spiritual sons and daughters are carrying that legacy to the next generation. And that's what we're seeing at Jesus Image. And we love you guys so dearly. I, I am so amazed that I'm here in this room today with them to see a vision that, that I've had that I knew I could never create. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the ability to raise that kind of money. I didn't have the ability to design that kind of a building. But uh, there's something God is doing with art today. It goes mm -hmm. beyond our imagination. It's a place. You know, I'm going to have to ask somebody to bring me. I'm bawling my eyes out. I need somebody <laughs> to bring me a handkerchief, okay? <laughs> That's dead. what I need. Uh, don't let an old man get touched with a spirit. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I hope I said something that makes sense. <laughs> Well, what are you feeling in closing? I know they want to read the a blessing. Do you guys have any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, first of all, it's so beautiful um, just to hear from you guys. And as you were talking, I kind of was thinking, I 
get so much now that I never understood as a child. Even to have you dedicate me, Pastor Tommy, what an honor. And just seeing how God is in the details and what you said, Amy, just how we want to carry on what fathers and mothers like you have really paved the way for us to walk into. So thank you so very much. Um, you have all of our love in our heart and we're so thankful for you. And Michael's typing to me on his iPad. He said, Pastor Tommy signed my Bible. Michael never changed the subject of Jesus ever. And that was in 2012. <laughs> yeah. I have a, a, you know, this couple will never know the amount of respect I have for them. Mm -hmm. This is what I, they have the heart that our world needs today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have the heart. I think the, the greatest respect that I have is found not only in the integrity of your hearts, but in the fact that you're guarding, you're guarding and protecting what you've been entrusted with. I have always been one that when I'm leading worship and when I'm preaching that there's a river and there's banks to those rivers and it comes from one place and it's the throne of God and the throne of God alone. Who am I to, to contaminate the river with my own agenda, with my own words, my own studies, my own stuff. And that's what we're here to do is to just get in, just jump in the river, protect it and guard it. And I think that's one of the greatest things I could ever say is not just about the anointing, but about the protection of the holiness of God, the holiness of what he's doing, because this generation can't have anything else. Nothing else is going to work. Uh, and I think that what I see in all of this is the the heart that the Culianos have to build build a piece of art. Mm -hmm. This, you know, yeah. we're, we're going to get to heaven. We're going to see the most beautiful art that the universe has ever seen. Uh, God is a creative God, mm -hmm. and 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 I think as they create whatever Jesus' image is going to be in the future. It's going to be a creative thing. And it goes without, you know, there's, there's no limit to the money. Mm -hmm. It's not that you, you know, you have to have money to build greatness. But money is not the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem is vision and dream. Mm -hmm. We've got to see what God wants to create in this world. Mm -hmm. Would you pray over Jesus' image and release yeah. a Father's blessing over Jesus' image before we go? I'd be glad to <laughs> take, take my hand. Lord, as a father and a daughter who has been privileged to know two great leaders of the future, I thank you, Lord, for the wonderful privilege I've had of being part of the Hinn family for so many years. I thank you for what you've done in their lives and what you've brought to the world through their lives. But Lord, that's only beginning because there's something greater happening now. And part of it's going to, through, going to be through the creation of art. They're going to build things that nobody's ever thought of building before. Lord, I pray because you need a place. You have designed in heaven a place where we're going to worship with the beauty of art, the beauty of worship, the beauty of music, the beauty of everything there is in the art world, where we lift our voices to God to worship him. Make a place of greatness, we pray. A place of presence. A place where you come to be our Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you both so much. Um, church, can we just let Pastor Tommy and his daughter Amy know how much we love and honor them?
All right, we're going to say goodbye, and we will see you soon. We love you guys. Yes, yeah, so before we close, um, I want to take this moment like we do every week. Please, no leaving. I've, I believe that many people are going to give their hearts right now to Jesus. So if you're watching in the room or even online and you say, Jess, I need to know Jesus. I'm desperate for him. I don't know him like I need to. Come on, the hour is late. Don't even wait. Just come down here right now. If that's you, or if there's anyone in the room that says, I need to come back to Jesus. I have forgotten my first love. Come on, don't even think about it for a moment. Just come down right now. If that's you, be safe. I've fallen out. You guys can all stand. That's fine. You can all stand. Come on, the hour is now. Now is the day for salvation. If, when Pastor Tommy was talking, there was so much in my heart that said, no more playing games, you know, no more playing games. So if that's you, you can just even start coming down. If that's you in the room and you say, now is the day that I need to get right with Jesus, no more games, no more living in the world, no more one foot in and one foot out. Come on, just come down to the altar. Be bold today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. All right, I'm gonna pray for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just pray. Maybe that's you and you're in your seats today. Maybe you're watching online and you know you have to get right with God. So let's just pray. Jesus, I thank you, Father, that all, you don't have to repeat after me right now. I'm just praying over you. Lord, that all the scales will fall off our eyes right now in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, that no weapon formed against these children will prosper in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, that now is the day, Lord, we will fully run after you, Jesus, with all of our hearts, Jesus. I thank you, God, for everything you've done. I just feel like there's someone that God is restoring. There's a marriage in here that's broken. It's even to the point of divorce where you've honestly thought, that it's about it's time to give up but God is going to restore and heal your marriage Jesus loves marriage it's a model after his heart for his church so Lord I thank you that you're restoring that marriage right now in Jesus name I thank you father there's somebody watching online that you have a teenage son he's around 18 years old or so and he's been running from God for about five years that's what I hear five and and you've been crying out you're a mother and you're watching online you've been crying out for his salvation. Lord, touch that boy right now in Jesus' name. Touch that boy in the name of Jesus, Lord. I thank you, Father, for the call of God on his life. So, Lord, I thank you. We give all of our hearts to you. If there's any sin in your life, just make it right right now with the Lord. Just speak it out right now. If there's any sin in your heart, it could be anger. It could be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be pornography. It could be pride. It could be putting anything above Jesus. If Jesus is not number one in your life, if he's not above all, you need to make him number one today. So, Lord, I thank you for all you're doing, Jesus. Lord, restore the joy and the wonder in our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name. I'm gonna do the altar call. Okay. Yeah, so I know there's a few people that came down, so you can all just repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Forgive me, Father, for all of my sins. I repent. I am a sinner and I am in need of a savior. So I give you my sins today, Lord Jesus. Take all of me, wash me clean with your blood. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Okay, pull it in. Yeah, Michael's saying just agree. Can we just agree real quick for all Pastor Tommy said and let's pull it in by faith. Everybody is. Lord, I just thank you. Come on, just agree with this, church. I need your agreement in this. I thank you, God, that every word that was spoken by Pastor Tommy, Lord, will come to pass, Lord, not just for this house, but for an entire generation, Jesus. I thank you, Father. Greater days are ahead, Jesus, for the body of Christ. Greater days are ahead, and I thank you that no more running away from you, Jesus, God, that there won't be children of God that run away, God. I thank you, God. Greater days are ahead. 
ahead in Jesus' name. Just say amen to that. Greater days are ahead in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are raising up a pure bride that will follow you with all of their hearts and never look back in Jesus' name. We seal it. We thank you, Father, for what you've done in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. If you need prayer, we'd love to invite our prayer team down here. You can come down here. We will see you tonight. We will be at church tonight. TiVo the Super Bowl and watch it later. It's gonna be amazing tonight. And we will see you next Sunday here. And we'll, our prayer teams can come down and we'd love to pray for you. Love you. Michael and Jess here. We are standing in the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. Local church, Jesus School, uh, House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us, the sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that, we believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we wanna invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is gonna do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're going to show you right now. We're going to take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County, right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program, yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for his people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus Image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10, 42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. 
The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for his presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. May millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space in the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property, a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named the Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped on this property. May his word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May his gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.